So, welcome everyone to our second session of uh, day two of Camp YA 2020. Uh, today we are, well, in this panel, it's New Horizons, and I'm really excited about this one because it's a panel of South African authors. And I don't get to experience this very often because I'm not usually in South Africa. Okay. So I thought let's, if we just start off, making sure that Demet can get hold of me if she needs me. Um, if we start off just with some introductions, so I'm gonna just cue you in and you introduce yourself and maybe your, your favorite of your books. I know that's hard to decide sometimes, it's like choosing a favorite child, but choose your favorite books to introduce if you have multiple. Okay, so if we start with Buntle, do you want to introduce yourself and your writing? Sure. I wish there'd been any indication given that this would be required. I would have prepared something really <laughs> smart sounding. Uh, but I'm, I'm Buntle Sinne. Um, I am a South African writer living in London year when she'll be able to return to South Africa. That's exciting. I write YA um, and uh, kind of middle grade, I guess, is the, the age group, 9 to 12 year olds. Um, my favorite book is the third book in my series, uh, the Shadow Chases uh, series, which is the book in red up there, um, because it has a lot of really interesting mythology and, and the whole series is really, there's a lot of research into African mythology. I'm really fascinated by folklore and myth and um, the history of supernatural activity in Africa. So yeah, it's me. So exciting. Okay, awesome. Joe, do you want to introduce yourself and your writing? Hi, ah, yes, I'm Joanne McGregor. I write in a couple of different genres, but when it comes to YA, again, a couple of different <laughs> genres. I, I write uh, YA contemporary romance, YA dystopian, and I also have a series that sort of uh, is on the border of younger YA, upper middle grade. Uh, my most successful book, I could, don't ask me to choose my favorite child, um, is oh, The Law of Tall Girls, which seems oh. to have gone down well. That's a, a YA contemporary romance. Yes. And it came before the Netflix movie about tall girls. Uh-huh. <laughs> Way before. You were there first. <laughs> okay. And Fiona. Hi, uh, my name's Fiona Snickers. I'm a South African author living in Johannesburg. I write for adults and I also write YA. I have two YA series. The first is uh, contemporary uh, called the Trinity series uh, about a girl who's working her way through high school and university. And um, I also have a time travel adventure series called the Time Maverick series. Um, and if you have to pin me down to my favorite book, it would have to be the one I'm currently working on, which is the fourth and final installment of the Time Maverick series called The Final Time. Ooh, very cool. Okay, so, and, and I feel like I should also add to everyone else watching, I am Danny. Danny reviews on Twitter. I'm a book blogger of over five years, and I'm also the person that keeps messing up on the stream. If anything goes wrong, it's probably my fault. So sorry about that. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm really excited for this African representation in this event. Uh, starting off, how would you describe, because we hear a lot from authors who are UK based or US based, and there are very established uh, publishing houses there that have global reach. And I know we have them here as well, but I'm really interested in diving into how publishing and the publishing journey might be different in South Africa or for international writers. So I'm wondering how you all got started in writing. So what what was your first experience with getting published like? So let's start with Joe this time. 
Um, I started in traditional publishing. So with that series that was upper uh, middle grade, younger YA. Um, and I got that published by a local publisher here. And they did a few of my, my adult books as well. Um, but, you know, we have quite a small book buying market here. And I was doing a lot of work with school visits and promotions. And it seemed insane to me that I would work for years on a book and earn as little as I did. And so I started to toy with the idea of writing for a bigger market, an international market, particularly the U.S. market. And then I started writing books set in the U.S.A. And South African publishers don't really want to publish books that are set overseas. Not unless you have a very South African character who's perhaps, I don't know, spying on someone in Paris or something. Um, so that I started getting a leg in the indie world as well. So I, I write for both. I do traditional publishing and uh, indie publishing. South African set books as well as overseas set books. Okay. And uh, Buntley, how did you get started? Um, after a series of um, dozens and dozens of really lovely reject letters um, from every big publisher in the country, <laughs> um, because uh, it was actually really interesting is that I, I started writing novels when I was a teenager. And so a lot of them were based on my teen experiences. And I kept on getting a lot of feedback that that was unrealistic because how could teenagers possibly behave with such abandoned, reckless behavior? Where were the parents? Um, which was obviously enough feedback to give to my mom, because um, clearly that wouldn't have gone down. But uh, how I started out was um, uh, basically, I was working for Puku Children's Literature Foundation, which is an NGO that's trying to bridge the digital divide for African children's books. I ended up interacting with a lot of people who kind of worked in the industry. Um, there was an organization called Funza Literary Trust that had a mobile, um, library of short stories that were available for teenagers for free. Um, recently, they've actually been zero rated for data in South Africa. So now on any network in South Africa, if you have, uh, whether you have data or you don't have data, you can now read thousands of stories uh, written by South African authors for, for kids. And uh, I wrote a couple of stories for them. They liked them a lot. They also happen to have a publishing house and they went, would you like to write a book? And here we are, right? So that's how Cover to Cover um, and Armour Funds of the Tree uh, Trust came to publish me. Oh, it's amazing. And yeah, the, the whole data thing here in South Africa, it's, it's one I have struggled with whilst I've been here. <laughs> Keep running out of data. Um, okay. And Fiona, how did you get started? Well, like Bontle, I weathered hundreds of rejections before I finally got published. And uh, one thing I, I decided to do was to stop writing a full novel before querying agents or publishers. I would just do the sort of three chapter synopsis, send it off, see if there was any interest. Most of the time there wasn't, but um, I kept going. And then to my vast surprise, a publisher asked to see the rest of it. But the problem was there was no rest of it. It was uh -huh. only three chapters. And, uh, that does not go down well at all in the publishing world when you confess that you've only written three chapters. Um, but luckily, they were patient with me. Um, I wrote the rest of it at top speed. When they had the whole thing, um, they accepted it. This was Jonathan Ball Publishers. Um, got a two-book deal, um, after which they promptly dumped me. Um, but luckily, another publisher was on hand to pick up the slack for the, the Trinity series, my first YA series. Awesome. Okay. So now you've mentioned this already, uh, Joanne, about the uh, being self-published and traditionally published. This is something that I know exists in other countries, but I'm wondering what, how that influences how you write here in South Africa. So. How does it compare to like publish something yourself? What what are the pros and cons to self versus traditional publishing for you? Um, are you asking how it influences the writings or what the pros and cons are as a writer? Hmm, a bit of both. So I guess 
how it, um, I, I'm curious how it influences what you choose to write about, for example. And yeah, later on, I'm also going to ask you about how that changes your marketing strategies as well. But let's start with how you, like what you choose to write. Um, I think that if you're going to write deliberately to sell in America or the UK, it can be quite hard to market a book that is very South African. So if it's very rooted in this culture, well, these cultures, because we're not a, a, a homogenous culture, our language and our idiom and our issues and our history, which can really percolate yes. into our stories, I, I don't know that the rest of the world necessarily wants to read that. So in, in my indie public books, with one exception, I have set them in the United States. Um, and that makes my job considerably harder. Oh, my gosh. You know, you have to just research everything and check everything and have all kinds of expert readers. Um, but on the upside, it does mean that you are exposed to a bigger audience who's more likely to take a chance on you. Um, whereas if your writing is very, very rooted in South Africa, I think it's easier to write because you, you you know the places, you know things the way things work you know how people speak you you know your characters you're rooted in your community but then it makes it harder to sell so you pays your money and you takes your choice i guess yeah okay and with your traditional publishing i think you mentioned before that that can be more south african but then you're limited to the audience here really aren't you those those were more South African. I because those were quite a few years ago. I got my I managed to get my rights back from the traditional publishers, and I then I thought I was going to do a quick edit and recover them and bring them out myself. But when I came to do it, I realised my writing had improved a lot in the intervening years. So it was a major rewrite, and I'm sad to say that I had to iron out some of the. Um, very granular details of South Africa or of accent or of okay. humor that I don't think overseas people would get. So so I tried to push it as much as I could without popping a reader out of the story because they didn't understand what I was talking about. And, you know, you have to circumvent some sorts of, of, of issues. You know, in yeah. America, you, you, you know about pavement and sidewalk, but what you don't know is that pavement is actually what covers the road there. Yeah. And you, you can't have somebody grazing their knees. You, the grazing there is, result, is sort of reserved for when a bullet just goes past you. So you would scrape your knees. So if you say they grazed their knees on the pavement, it's somebody shooting them in the middle of the road. Whereas here that would be you fell down on the sidewalk kind of thing. So yeah. there's a lot to there's a lot to trip you off and and some to, uh, trip you up and sometimes I just think oh please can I write another book set here but then I'm you know I, I lose that audience that I'm building up on that side. Yeah. Okay. Fiona, you've also got books set here. Why? So why did you choose to set your books in South Africa versus overseas? Um. I think because I was just starting out as a writer and um, I, I didn't feel able to inhabit a world that I didn't really know. Um, and I actually am passionate about telling South African stories. Um, I love my country. I love its idioms. I love the people. And um, I think there's a there's quite a, a gap um, in which teens don't see themselves represented in fiction in South Africa. And um, I, I was passionate about filling that gap, about um, showing people characters who looked and sounded like them. Um, this is something that Bontle has talked about quite extensively. Um, so... <laughs> It was something that I was just enthusiastic about doing and am still enthusiastic about doing. Uh, the last book in my uh, Trinity series came out only last year, and it probably isn't the absolute last. I'll probably do another one. 
Um, so I'm by no means done with South Africa. It's something I love writing about. But uh, as it says, the buying market is small. And um, if you're writing full time and want to make money out of it, then you well, one way is to think of setting your books internationally. And that's something I've felt more confident moving into doing as I become more experienced as a writer. Okay. And then on the flip side, Bentley, your well, that, ooh, has she just dropped just as I was about to talk to her? <laughs> just, ooh, she's coming back. back. It looks like, yeah. I have returned. <laughs> Um, <laughs> all I heard was on the fifth side, Bunsle, and then immediately out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was going to ask you, you've got your books it, infused with that African mythology and, you know, with characters of color, which I think is really important too. Why did you choose the, or I guess, why did that story want to be told? Why did you feel like you had to share these stories with the world from an African perspective? I think that, you know, when we talk about representation and we talk about visibility, uh, it's a conversation which has gained a lot more momentum recently, but it certainly wasn't the kind of conversation people were having 10, 15 years ago, at least in the literary circles that I was running in. So uh, I remember reading so many wonderful books that were British and American with so many things which, you know, what Joe's talking about, about not understanding the idioms and exactly how things work in the in the in South Africa. It's the same thing that I experienced trying to read those books in the United mm -hmm. States and just being like, oh, snow, that sounds like a fun concept. Interesting. <laughs> um, a snowy Christmas. Wow, that, that would be what fun. What is that? It's like 30 degrees. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Like a lot of it was just so out of place and out of time and disconnected from my lived experience, from the way that my friends lived, for, from everything that I understood. And even if, as I traveled more, as I grew older, those experiences still had very little resonance for me as an individual. And so I felt as the kind of stories that I wanted to tell would be the kind of stories that should make uh, an African child feel seen and feel like they had a place in the world and they had a place in a fantastical world. They could be in magic, they could be a wizard, they could believe in, you know, warrior, princesses or whatever they wanted right but it didn't yeah. have to be set in uh europe or in the united states yeah okay i think sometimes the the, the story idea also defines the genre that you write it in and the setting that you write it in um the, the idea for my recoil trilogy which is a dystopian came to me and it had to be set in the states it would have been a very different story in south africa That's true. Um, yeah, I, um, it's been amazing watching it kind of happen with the pandemic. Um, whereas, you know, some my my eco warriors thing, those are so rooted in South Africa, in the in the Karoo and in the mountains and in Isimangaliso. So sometimes it's the story um, that that demands to be told as an adult story or a YA or a middle grade or you you know where it demands to be set because each country brings its own baggage i guess and it's its own uh context that you have to write yeah so i i want to i guess explore this uh this need to tell african or south african stories to the rest of the world do you ever feel do you feel pressure to to write about south africa do you feel like you it's like a, a responsibility that you have at all? Sorry, I cut out, so I don't know who you are asking. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start off then. Um, it's a question about um, responsibility to write South African African stories. And I think no, because in a weird way, I think South Africa has always punched above its weight in terms of literary success and in terms of reach into the rest of the world. As difficult as it is for South African authors to sell, certainly there are some very well-known um, South African authors in the rest of the world. So uh no i think i would go back to kind of joe's statement about it's the story that really matters and some of those stories just happen to be rooted in south africa or in africa and you want to tell the story more than do kind of i guess a, a sales campaign for south africa and how awesome it is okay i don't know fiona do you have anything to add on that do you ever feel 
um, you should be I've, writing I South African stories? I believe that there are... I believe there are authors who have felt that pressure as though they're betraying their own country by setting a story elsewhere or trying to make it overseas, trying to make it big. I personally haven't felt that pressure. Um, and for me, setting a book in South Africa has always been something that I wanted to do, something that I felt comfortable doing. It's It's a bit like putting on a pair of really comfortable shoes, you know, all that research that Joe was talking about, the anxiety about getting the idioms right, um, it just evaporates, it just goes away. Um, there are other anxieties um, as a South African author, perhaps particularly as a white South African author. Um, there are conversations that have, have come up recently about um, representation, who is the best person to tell a story, who in fact has the right to tell a story, um, white authors writing black characters, Do should they be doing it at all? Do they do it well? Um, should they be doing it better? Uh, who's the, the person to be telling that story? So those kind of anxieties afflict one um, as, a, as a South African author. And I think it's right that those conversations are being had and that we're being much more conscious of those decisions and much more careful about them. Um, I remember 11 years ago when I started my Trinity series, really rushing in where angels fear to tread and having absolutely no hesitation in believing that I could write a character of color. And now, 11 years on the track with book, I was much more conscious of what I was doing, uh, much more insecure that I, I was actually the right person even to be telling the story, much more thoughtful about it. And that's that's probably a good thing. Yeah. Joe, do you have anything to add? I have sort of had a feeling, but maybe I'm paranoid and I'm projecting it onto people. That's entirely possible. However, I have sometimes had the sense that I'm regarded as an odd duck because all my stories are not South African because more than half of my stories now are indie. And I was one of the earlier ones, I think, to start treading that path. And so in a, in a way, I, I came into the South African literary scene because I was originally traditionally published, and then they couldn't kick me out <laughs> when I became indie and started writing things set overseas. So I'm, I'm not writing novels of political relevance. And, and in South Africa, I think even the personal is political. And partly that's why some of my stories are set overseas, because I want to be freed from always having to consider that. I, I, there, there are other interesting story ideas to me. Yeah. So I sometimes feel like I am a little judged, but on the other hand, I have written five stories here, and I feel like I've paid my dues. And, um, you know, I've, I've got to write the stories that come to me. That's my integrity. And... Um, some of those stories can be told in the text in the same way as some South African stories just can't can't just you can't just unplug the story and, and set it yeah. somewhere else. It doesn't necessarily work. So I don't know, maybe you should speak to the other people in the literary scene. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually you've raised but a, I think, oh sorry. <laughs> no, I was gonna say I think I think the it's reflective of an overall prejudice against independent I mean it, people didn't even call it indie publishing. 10 years ago, right? It was just self-published and it was considered to be trash, right? It was bad quality and poorly edited and you didn't spend money on it doing it. And you just said, that was the impression that was given. And I think the challenges is the rest of the world, I think has moved on quite substantively from that. And I'm not sure that the South African literary circle has done the same. They haven't expanded their minds to imagine it could actually be really quality work. They just see self-publish and go, ooh. Yeah. Oh, that's a shame because I know some very, very, very great. Some of my favorite books have been self-published or indie published, and it's. And then I've read traditionally published books that were not my cup of tea. Well, nothing's my cup of tea, but not my cup of hot chocolate, shall we say? So I, I really hope that this, yeah, this prejudice can go away. Um, I was. 
Now, I am South African. I haven't really grown up here, but I do know about the the context. It's a trying to explain South African cultures and the politics here can be quite challenging sometimes to people from outside of South Africa. But I'm curious what what is one thing you would want um, a non-South African reader to understand about South Africa to help them understand Ooh. your writing? So I'm, I'm such watching an awesome faces. question, and, I, and I, I'm not sure I, I even know. Pontle, help! <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was trying to think about it in the context of, of my own work um, because it is um, censored, centered very much around a fantastical and completely made world, but it is very much rooted within contemporary South African realities, right? So the main character is um, her father is basically a mobster um, and uh, her best friend is someone who his aunt works for their family, right? He's the help. He, and for me, it was really interesting to be able to tell stories uh, as more characters join in on the adventure. They're from different socioeconomic backgrounds. They are all black and brown children, but from very different cultures. I have a Muslim character that comes in at some point, and not because she's Muslim, like there is actually the kind of a story behind it. But I think that's the thing that I would love people to understand is that um, people's racial identity is not their full identity. There are many other layers to what it means to be South African. Um, that have a lot more to do with socioeconomics or culture or personal interests or personality. And so it's possible to be more than just one type of thing in South Africa. And I think that's often the brush that many South Africans get painted by is often based on their racial prejudice or their experience of oppression or um, inequality, which is fair, but I think there's also more to identity than that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to jump in here. I'm going to say the one thing. So growing up in international schools, I would be like, I'm from South Africa. And they would ask me if I grew up in a mud hut or if I had lions in my backyard, in my garden. Uh, so I would like people to know that South Africa does have cities. <laughs> we have houses. <laughs> we have internet, believe it or not. Um, so maybe not something that I want people to know for my writing, because I have no writing, but just in general about South Africa, we are not, we are, you know, a, a country with cities and villages and all sorts of environments. It's not just one single static sort of environment all across the country. <laughs> there was a, a tourism um logo a while ago a world in one country uh, because in terms of our landscape we have you know deserts and mountains and beaches and and wildlife and and all kinds we even have a bit of snow in places um but it's really true i think culturally we have 11 official different languages we have very sophisticated kind of first world cities rubbing on my, you know, third world areas. We have fantastic technology in some areas in, in perhaps private sectors. And in the same sectors, we can have really third rate stuff. And we've got all kinds of stories. Um, so I wish people would give South African literature a chance. And, and um, you know, there are amazing people telling amazing stories here. And Whatever you want, whether you want romance or you want thrillers or you, you want something exciting, um, the stories are really coming out of South Africa now. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, so I want to also touch on marketing of your books as international authors, as South African authors, especially since you are sometimes not always based in South Africa, wouldn't they? Um, and also some of your writing is not actually set in South Africa, it's set overseas. How does this, how does that influence how you market your work? And how does it vary across the different books? So Fiona, I don't know if you want to start. 
Okay, well, the experience of of marketing your own book used to be very different according to whether you were traditionally published or self-published. Um, it used to be that you could rely on your publisher to do all the heavy lifting for you in terms of marketing. And I think people, all over, writers all over the world have discovered that those days are over, days where a big budget would be allocated to a sort of mid-level book or to a, a beginning author. Um, those days are just over. Every author is expected to have a social media presence, expected to be active on it, um, a lot to promote their own work. The that getting it to you, especially as a first-time author, is really rather small um, and might amount to no more than uh, a lot of review copies being sent out, sort of scattershot to a whole bunch of people, mm. hoping to get some uh, newspaper and magazine placements with your reviews. And the rest is really up to you. Um, uh, one is recognized, but otherwise... You know, you must take the initiative and all owns, um, which of course made the crossover to self-publishing a whole idea because then you you know it is all down to you. Um, and in a way, you have more control um, when you go into indie publishing because you can decide to run a pain uh, and advertise. You can decide book ad or um, Amazon marketing services ads. Um, you can decide what, what's the right thing to do at the, a certain time for your book. So you have a lot of control. Um, and really, you to where in the world you are. Uh, no real in-person events. You have as much access to the advertising uh, methods that anybody else does. You can do the Facebook ads, the AMS, the BookBub. Um, you've got equal access to those resources. So, yeah, it's it's very different depending upon um, traditional self publishing as to where you're writing from. I think the experience is pretty much the same. Okay. Bodley, I think you're 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 writing and publishing in all sorts of countries aren't you so yeah my last my last book was published in ghana oh. um so yeah it, it is very different publishing in south africa versus publishing in in ghana and i i think that that's also um the the maturity also of children's publishing and and why publishing in southern africa versus in western africa and eastern africa it's very different there's there's quite a quite a gap um and the interesting thing is i think i spend i don't spend very much time thinking about marketing because i, I just don't have the time to spend thinking about it because i'm i'm a i have a full-time tech corporate job <laughs> which is actually kind of a money job so the only thing i can spend time on is actually kind of thinking about writing the books and then showing up at events. So I've been lucky in the sense that I was able to hire a publicist for the for the last of my Shadow Chasers books and just say, you know what, I will use my day job to cross subsidize my writings things. Um, and did the same kind of recently got someone to handle my Instagram account because I also was like, I can't keep up with it. Joanna is exactly right. Like there is so much demanded of you to, to do stuff. And often I just don't really have the time. And I think my book in Ghana really suffered for it, to be honest, because I didn't have the time. And traditional publishers do not have the, the budget or the time either, right? So if you are not willing to really go in there and put focus into it and really put the energy into it and understand the whole landscape of what it means to market your work and also not feel embarrassed by that. Cause I've spoken to a lot of writers who are like, Oh, you know, it's so terrible having to do this myself and it feels so weird and I hate talking about myself and hate tweeting about myself and da, da, da. you have to kind of overcome those mental barriers as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I'm not sure I have fully done all of that, to be honest. Okay. Yeah. And I Sorry, Joe. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, just your, your question about marketing the different books differently. Um, I, most of my marketing is now online, but for my South African books and in South Africa, I would do more in-person events. Um, I've been fortunate to, to be invited to some of the festivals and book fairs, which are now beginning to start uh, inviting indie authors, um, which is 
tremendously brave of them. Um, and so I would do more in-person events here, but for the overseas market, it's uh, the international market, it's, it's a lot more online. It does complicate things. You have to sort of split your mail list because things go out at different times and you add, like, there's no point in saying, hey, come to my in-person event in Cape Town on Thursday and sending that to somebody who lives in Chicago. So I, I kind of try to split up my mail list and my advertising um, a bit that way. Uh, so everything is complicated. But I'm also at the point now where so many books I, I can't advertise them all I can't pay attention to them all I really just want to write I wish somebody would do the marketing for me I, I no longer have the issue about feeling embarrassed to hustle I kind of got over that one you know if you stand still enough I'll try and st stand still long enough I'll try and sell you one of my books but um, so I don't have the time I also have a daytime job and it just becomes like, are we here to write or, or did we choose to be marketers, you know? So um, when you indie publish, and, and even to an extent, I think, when you, when you traditionally publish, you are almost a one-person publishing house. You, you have to coordinate the cover design and the editor and the proofreader and the formatter and, you know, get you, you write the book and then you have to do the advertising and marketing. And it's just, it's a lot of work. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I think also we should not, um, some of the traditional publishers and certainly my publisher is so amazing. They do mm -hmm. so much, uh, even within their limited means. So I think mm -hmm. that is one of the reasons why I've chosen to traditionally publish mm -hmm. as opposed to self-publish is it really does take, you do have to be a full-time publishing house yourself if you choose mm -hmm. to be an independent publisher. Mm -hmm. And it's just not feasible for a lot of us. Yeah, because... Yeah, you you do have lives outside of writing, and I, I actually think it's really cool the things that you do. <laughs> um, so, would you? I'm curious what it is that you do outside of writing, and how do you think that influences your writing, if at all? So, Joe, do you want to start? Uh, yeah. So I'm a. I'm a counseling psychologist in private practice. I've been a, a psychologist and psychotherapist for 20 years. And before that, I was a high school English teacher. And um, both of those definitely influenced my writing. I always loved teens. It's why I taught high school English. And um, the psychology, you know, not only do I, I see teenagers and, and adults, I don't work with kids. Um, but I, I, I like to think anyway that my understanding of personality and of trauma and of issues like depression and anxiety and self-esteem um, deepen, and, and psychopathology, because I do, I do like writing baddies, um, really deepen the way that I write character and response. I, I have read some YA books where, you know, mummy dies on Monday and by Friday that heroine is saving the world again you know, she's finished with her crying and, and kind of it's not how it works. No. And I think depression is badly represented. And I think uh, people who know nothing about it take an, an oppositional stance against medicines, which can be life-saving. And don't even get me started on how therapists are portrayed as, I don't know, people lacking integrity and wanting to sleep with their patients and wanting the work. It's just crazy. So, so yeah, I think that does influence my writing. Um, I hope it does anyway, and that it's kind of more psychologically realistic, you, you know. I, so I think that appeals to some readers. Some readers, I think, don't want something that complex. They want um, uh, perhaps a lighter read. So, you know, we, we, we each write what we do, but absolutely it influences it. Awesome. It also exhausts me so that the days when I do therapy, I can't do writing. So that's not, uh, that, that's, that, that's the flip side of it. It's bad. And what I don't do, and I'm, I'm careful to say this every time, is I don't plumb my patients for stories. So, you know, I, I do therapy in a separate venue, although now it's online. Um, and no matter how amazeballs what I hear, in therapy it kind of stays locked in that side of my brain and I don't think oh well, that's a nice little thing I'm going to put it in this story because that would just be you know ethically very wrong yeah 
attempting. <laughs> Don't say tempting. No one's going to come to you after that. Don't say that stuff out loud. <laughs> yeah, no, I won't. No, I won't. I'm a person of integrity and I don't and I haven't. And and I've got amazing stories in my head, but they're locked up and they won't ever come out. But it's let me just tell you, you that. whatever I write, it, real life is worse, okay, and strange. Well, which, which I was about to say is like actually very <laughs> concerning for me because Joe has written some adult baddies, which I try not to think about because it just it concerns me so deeply still years later. Um, and Scott is like one of my favorite um, YA books yes. ever, actually, because I really loved the the realism of all the feelings that were going on there. I was like, yes, I feel you. You're actual people with real feelings. And this is like a legitimate, believable, realistic, which I really like. But anyway. Um, yeah. What, like, what do you do for talking? a day? Yes. Oh, my day job? Mm. Oh. Um, <laughs> I do actually like my day job, so I shouldn't be so dismissive. Uh, I'm a uh, executive at a at a tech company in the UK. So I lead um, a team of uh, trans transformation specialists that are trying to transform the way that the organization thinks about technology, strategy, digital, a whole bunch of things, which is very exciting. And before that, I was a consultant at a top tier consult management consulting firm uh, where I mostly did digital work. The the interesting thing for me is that I, I was trying to think about it as Joe was answering it. I think the biggest influence has been the ability to travel because in my mm -hmm. five years, um, I was at McKinsey and Company and in my five years at McKinsey, I spent over half that time living in hotel rooms <laughs> elsewhere. And Ooh. so, you know, my, my first book was, a lot of it was written in Sierra Leone. And my second book had a lot of influences um, from elsewhere in West Africa. My third book, I was in Nigeria for a bunch of events. <laughs> like uh, I wrote another book a little bit when I was in Rwanda. There was a bit of Kenya and another. So that was a really interesting way of keeping things very fresh in my mind because I didn't have to root myself entirely in just South Africa and what was going on in South Africa, but really actually had a much more international and much more African flavor that I wouldn't have had otherwise without that job. And if I think about now living in London, uh, I live in London because of my job. It, the only reason I moved was for work purposes. And uh, the kind of stories I'm writing now really do feel very uh, both continents, both you know South Africa and the UK mm -hmm. kind of in those stories. So I think where I am geographically more than the work that I'm doing definitely plays into it. But I do tend to work 14, 15, 16 hour days. So yeah, that's not very yeah. conducive for time for writing. Yeah, tech jobs, always online. I know that feeling right now. Um, and Fiona, how does your non-writing life influence your writing? Can she hear me? Oh, I don't know. Mission control to Fiona. Mission control to Fiona. Ooh. Houston, we have a problem. I feel like the tech person in me is like, have you tried turning it on and off? Yeah, right. <laughs> have you tried pulling it out, turning it over and pushing it in again? No. <laughs> have you tried resetting the router? <laughs> <laughs> or in my case, I have, a, I have an LTE dongle and I'm just like, I'm just going to like nudge it to see if that improves the signal a bit. <laughs> That's my Am I back? Right now. Yes, yes, you are. You're back. There we go. Okay, good. I, I went out and went back in again. Okay, so uh, in terms of my job, at the moment, for the last few years, I've been a full-time writer. But before that, I worked as a journalist. And um, as well as exposing me to all kinds of stories, I think it taught me to research. Um, I, I know how to sort of filter out the nonsense and home in on what's important in terms of research. Um, it also taught me to write to a line and to produce a set number of words within a particular amount of time, which I found useful in, in sort of upping my productivity as a writer. Um, and what else? Yeah, maybe just an ability to fail news um, and, uh, an ability to perhaps write more true to life because I've I dealt with so many true life stories that I have a sense of what is probable and what's not, even if it's in a, an entirely 
made up world. Cool. Really interesting. I love how everyone's got such different backgrounds and it's not all you came from publishing, you work in publishing. You've got varied perspectives. That's really awesome. I think okay. it's easier to get published. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I think, I, know. I think that's that's actually true, right? Because I'm I'm still a part owner of a feminist publishing house, Majaji Books, which is where I started my professional life. Actually, in publishing before I went to go do other things. Oh, yeah, but um, it was interesting. People would ask me like afterwards, they'd be like, "Oh, well, you worked in publishing, so you must know how to get published." And I was like, "I still have no idea how to get published. <laughs> I could not tell you. I still get rejected all the time. It's great." I. <laughs> Yeah, oh, those those letters must be so fun to get. Those rejections. No. <laughs> nope. no. Um, okay, so I feel like I have to bring it up. We are currently experiencing a very strange time, and it's it's actually it must be really strange, uh, Joe, for you having written uh, the Recoil series. And then kind of watching what's happening in America right now and the rest of the world. But for me, it's me watching America. Um, I want you to pick one of your characters um, and tell me how they would be reacting right now to the pandemic. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. So, so the recall trilogy is set in a near future America when a terrorist spread sort of bio plague uh, has wreaked pandemic havoc and people are in lockdown and they have to sanitize all the time. And um, what interested me, why that story came to me was I was, you know, if there was a pandemic, what, what effect would this have on personal freedoms? And at the time, the cops were already... You know, if you Googled, I don't know, knapsack and dynamite or pressure cooker or something, they were already like barging into your house in America without arrest warrants and and, and smashing down the door and arresting you. And I thought, you know what? It, it would be such a great opportunity to rescind personal freedoms in a situation like that. So that's what I wanted to explore. And, and I did create this president with floppy hair and a wall between Mexico and, and all these, and, and we send it, um, you know, abortion rights um, and, and, and all kinds of things like that. So my, my heroine is a little bit naive when she goes in this. She believes everything she's told, but the, the hottie that I'm still in love with, when she meets the special academy where, where she trained to become a sniper, uh, he's a bit more woke, you know. He's a bit more wakey about what's happening, what the government's actually up to, and and uh, he's involved in a resistance to kind of push back against this erosion of personal rights. You know, so, he really keeps... <laughs> so yeah. So how he would be feeling is exactly how he's feeling in the book. We, we've got to fight this. We've got to resist this. It's sneaky. They they they're trying to scare us. Not that it isn't real. But that we've got to watch out what we're prepared to trade for being safe um, because we might not get that back again. So, yeah, he, he would be doing actually exactly what he does in the book, like working underhand to try and destabilize and investigate and be sexy. <laughs> <laughs> Very Hard work. important work Hard there, work. yeah. Yeah. So, but like, which which character and how would they be reacting? Uh, so I'm going to pick Oyo, who is um, based loosely, uh, strongly on the, on the um, West African goddess of the Orisha um, set of gods and goddesses in African mythology. And uh, Oyo is kind of, she's always up for chaos, um, parties, uh, thunder, lightning, floods, the kind of general jam so i feel like oyo would be uh celebrating the demise of of um stability rationality uh people being sensible she'd be really excited that it was suddenly cool to like be chaotic 
uh, and she'd be uh, having a party without wearing a mask, I assume, because she's not a responsible <laughs> response. Social distancing would not be a thing for her. So yeah, that, that's what she would be doing. So she'd love those those rallies, Trump's rallies. Well, <laughs> if she could flood them or something, like send lightning down to them, you know, like she would, she would, she's not, she's not rational in how she's sending chaos and disorder to things, right? So she would just be like, ah, those look like, it looks like fun people to mess with. So let's did mess with them. Did she stop the pandemic? <laughs> Maybe I, I mean, I should ask you if you started the <laughs> pandemic. Are you some sort of warlock? <laughs> like, what? Every time I read a book Fortune that's teller. pre-pandemic that has like a lot of pandemic-y things, I'm like, this is a gigantic like Wiccan circle or something. There is like <laughs> some sort of coven that I'm not part of, but you guys are all part of because this is all really weird now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I was just about to ask Fiona. <laughs> See if she comes back. Um... In the meantime, if, so going back to that, um, your publishing journey, if you could go back and give yourself one piece of advice to younger you about writing for sell after market or just writing in general, what would that be? So Joe, do you want to go first? Um, I tell myself to start sooner. I, I, um, when we were young, and you know, Bontley was saying how they how there weren't many South African books. They really weren't. We were all raised on Enid Blyton, right? And, and My I mom thought that was. was a product. I thought it was a thing, like a chocolate that came stamped with this name. I, I didn't actually yeah. understand it was a person who wrote the story. So, so I, I, I didn't know anyone who wrote stories that that for me wasn't something I could do as a career and it was really only when Joe Rowling wrote the Harry Potter books that I thought she's a woman in her 40s and you know she wrote a story and honestly could could I maybe not give that a shot um and when I started writing then of course I met all these fabulous South African writers so um I would say start earlier and I would say hit the indie gold rush in 2012 when you know Kindle comes out and there isn't enough book stock and everybody's buying books, that would be my, my advice. Okay, I I would um, I would tell myself two things. The first thing was I think I spent a lot of time agonizing over the fact that what I really wanted to be was a writer, and I just felt that there was no, it was not a sensible thing to do. Right, it's not a career that you could make money off of. I've subsequently lived yes technically you may be able to make some money off of it but i still personally haven't really made very much <laughs> i haven't made rent money from writing let's put it that way um but i spent a lot of time agonizing and and gave up writing for at the time which felt like the longest period since i could write since i was like six years old that i hadn't written which was like two months now i've had this experience of the pandemic so you know that's all behind me this is now the longest period i haven't written but the point was i really did an agonization of going like I need to pick a serious job. I need to pick a serious career. I need to study something meaningful and make money and make my parents proud and contribute to the family. And I thought that that excluded writing and that that wasn't serious enough. Um, so I would tell myself that that is not the case. So you should probably start again, write, write earlier, right? Um, and, and take yourself more seriously as a writer. And I think the second thing I would do is also release myself from the baggage of feeling that Adult books were the only serious books. Literary novels were the only interesting, important works to be writing. I would release myself from that baggage earlier uh, and allow myself to write YA with full abandon um, because I didn't for a very long time even want to be involved in this, this, this because I bought into the hype that has been created of these real books and important stories, uh, meaningful stories. And now I realize that they may be the most meaningful stories and important stories, um, especially for people who the stories resonate with and who otherwise do not have a voice and do not have visibility. Hallelujah, really. I, I, I second all of that. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, Fiona, are you, do you want to, share what your advice for a, a younger you would be so the you that yes, you were when you were uh, writing sure. for the first time uh can you all see me and hear me now yeah 
Okay, okay great. Um, my advice to my younger self would be to get over myself and do an actual writing course. Um, I thought that I could teach myself, and in a way I was right, just far along. Um, I made so many rookie mistakes. All those rejections that I used to get, I actually deserved every one of them um, because I just – I didn't know the craft. I didn't understand it. I thought I could teach myself to write purely by being a very enthusiastic reader. And I still think that being a reader is a very important part of it. But um, just have uh, somebody teach me the basics. Um, if I had just even read Stephen King's book on writing 10 years before I actually did read it, uh, just to do a course, just some feedback, just basics under my belt so that I could then start being creative and, you know, doing all the things I subsequently did. But uh, I, I say that to writers starting out now all the time. Do a course, do a good course um, that can teach you the basics and then you'll see you will start to fly a lot earlier than it. I feel very dragged by that having never done a writing course. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I have uh, some questions from the audience. First one is, is there a story you've always wanted to tell but haven't yet? That's from Liz. So, Joe, you're nodding enthusiastically, so you can go. Oh, first. yeah, I know, hundreds. I mean, I've got a great one that I'm dying to get to. I'm trying to finish the book I'm on now so I can start that, and that will be a, a YA one but yeah the ideas are easy um it's the it's the finding the time to write and the discipline and finishing what you write that that well for me anyway that's the hard part but uh, so many ideas so many okay Fiona a few years ago when I went into indie publishing I finally gave myself the permission to tell all the stories that I in my and that was so it was it was amazing. You know, when you traditionally published, they won't accept more than one book a year from you. Mm -hmm. And that is a lot. If you have regularly accepting one book a year from you, you are doing extremely well. You are a prolific author. But what if you've got six books a year inside you? What if you've got so many stories that your head is absolutely bursting with them? And just giving myself that permission to say, I don't need to rely on publishers anymore. I will write and publish my own stories and get them out there. I don't really care if anybody reads them or not. That was my attitude back then. Now I actually do care. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I just feel much more relaxed about it now. I know those stories are going to come out unless the Rona gets me first. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully not. Um, let's let's all stay safe. Um, Bentley, what about you? Is there something you've done to write? I have toyed with that. writing a memoir of my uh, teen years for a long time, uh, but I think my my mother would maybe kill me if I were to do such a thing, which I'm not sure about because there's really <laughs> nothing that bad about her that's in it, but. I don't know if she wants to read any of that. So that's the one thing which I think it's really tough trying to think about how to tell real stories. Everyone always imagines your writing is autobiographical in some sense and has something to do with some trauma in your life or whatever. But actually writing about trauma in your life, I think that that's a very different ballgame. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Now I'm going to combine. So I've got another question and I'm looking at the time. Um, got another question that I'm going to combine with one of my own. So to round things off, what, what do you love most about South Africa? And who's your, or do you have a South African author or book that you would like to recommend? Okay. Or African, if there's someone from another country in Africa as well. But so a favorite thing about South Africa and a book you would recommend. So, Joe. 
Um, my favorite thing is the land. I, I love the land. I love the felt. I love the mountains and the animals and the sea and the ocean. Um, and I'm taking strain locked up in my house and, and not getting out there. So, so that absolutely is the best thing for me about South Africa. Uh, for books, I would recommend for YA the, the books of Edith Bulbring. Um, either The Mark, which is also a dystopian book, or Snitch, uh, which is a, a high school boy who gets himself into trouble snitching. Uh, but she's, she writes great stories um, with uh, an I love them. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I, I, it was hard for me to get hold of The Mark. My mom actually had to go to a shop here because I couldn't get it through my usual avenues online so yeah but that was really good uh fiona favorite thing about south africa and a book you'd recommend the thing i love most about south africa is that it's the play world i feel completely completely at home um in place where i don't have to explain myself to anybody um, I'm here, I'm still living in the same community that I was born into. Um, I can go into a shop and be served by somebody who remembers what I was like 40 years ago. Um, I love that feeling of rootedness and of being completely, completely at home. Um, in terms of book recommendations, um, uh, for adults, uh, the very well-known author Lauren Bierkus has a, a new book out at the moment. Um, also a pandemic novel, just totally coincidentally, called Afterland. Um, and in YA, apart from the ladies on this panel, um, I would recommend books by Cajiso Lesego, who currently lives in Canada. Um, and uh, perhaps uh, this book betrays my brother is a really, really amazing work of YA fiction. I would recommend it heartily. Awesome. And Bunte, your favorite thing about South Africa and a book you recommend? I love that South Africans are really straight talking into the point. I think it's interesting having worked with uh, so many different people from very different countries in different countries. And South Africans, I think, are the most blunt, direct <laughs> people who but can talk friendly. about all sorts of incredibly... Still, it's super friendly, but um, we'll talk about all sorts of topics. Like trying to talk about race, for example, South Africans super happy. We'll get into it. Whereas in other countries, it's very much like, oh, I don't know, oh, can't, yeah. uh, right? And I love that South Africans just. Uh, we've clearly moved past all. Um, uh, I'm not saying we're getting those topics right, but we are at least open to having the conversation and can have the conversation without the edge of politeness and um, and false harmony. So that's something I love. Um, for adults, I would say Nikum um Way Back Home is definitely uh, one of my favorite uh, books. It's very much steeped in Johannesburg and very much steeped in Johannesburg in a particular time. I absolutely love it. Uh, and then uh, for YA, besides uh, Joe and Fiona, uh, I would say uh, Sally Ann Partridge has a collection of really a really great backlist of really interesting novels. Um, mm -hmm. So I would I would say S.A. Partridge, yeah. Amazing. Well, thank you all for joining us today. And thank you for everyone watching. This was really great, very fun for me. And I can't wait to read more of your writing and read these recommendations that you've just shared. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having us. Thank you, guys. Bye, guys. Absolutely. Thank you.